Welcome and good afternoon. And how many of you have heard already today that it's the 42nd Caller Lab Convention in Springfield? As far as I know, it's as far as I know, it's the first one in Springfield. But it's the 42nd Caller Lab Convention, and we are in Springfield. It is March 31st, and this is a session called Sound Bites. My name is Wendy Vandermeulen. I'm from Ottawa, Canada, and I'm your moderator today. And we have two panelists today, Mike Seastrom on my right here, and Justin sitting up there with his computer. Um, I, have a, I asked them for some introductions, and I got pages and pages and pages of material. So I'll try to uh, just reduce it a little bit. Uh, Justin uh, is from... Memphis. He didn't tell me that. Okay. Justin has been in the square dance activity since about 2000. He started calling in 2003. He's been at nine nationals and four Caller Lab conventions. He's currently chairman of the youth committee for Caller Lab and records for Royal Records. So he hasn't been around long and he's already very busy. He, his goal is to blend the tradition of square dancing with 21st century, and of course 21st century is all about internet and computers and stuff like that, so he was a perfect fit for this thing, and welcome Justin. Mike Seastrom is from somewhere in California, Los Angeles, and he's been dancing since 1960 and calling since 1963. Joined Caller Lab in 1977, has been very busy in Caller Lab, serving on several committees, being on the Board of Governors, and was also chairman of the board for two years. He records for Rhythm Records, has been on the staff of Rhythm Records, records Caller School, teaches from basic through C1, does a lot with multi-cycle, and travels quite extensively, and uh, he's also very looking forward to the future in square dancing, so he's also a good fit. Welcome, Mike. Thank you very much for, for being here. Okay, I have a few words to say as an opening, and then I'm going to hand it over to Mike, who's then going to hand it over to Justin. This is a taped session, so if you want something to say, um, please make sure you don't say anything until you have the microphone. And when you have the microphone, please it hold to your mouth and not down here so it doesn't pick up on the microphone, on the tape. Okay, sometimes you listen to them and you can't hear people, so please hold the microphone to your mouth. Okay, the topic for today, Sound Bites, is explained as a discussion on how to create compelling content for effective media, whether writing for publication, and I assume they mean hard copy, or social media, which is soft copy, knowing what to say and how to say it is what will capture the attention of those who are reading. This panel will present media tips for effective writing, how to present positive, eye-appealing articles and posts that will attract the attention of all ages without stereotyping the square dancing activity as being old, what to say, and what not to say. To help me prepare for this presentation, I sat down with a guy that I know from a business networking group I used to go to. He's a real estate agent and does like 101% of his stuff online. So I'm going to share a few nuggets of knowledge I got from the meeting that I have with him that I found were very interesting. And I can't say I'm doing them all. Um, my aim is to eventually, you know, it's going to be added to the list of things I do when I retire. But anyway, first of all, you do have to consider yourself a business and you are the marketing department. Everything you do has to be done with that thought in the back of your mind. And of course, we all know that marketing is about eye appeal and first impressions and what you say and how you say it. Whatever social media you use, the whole idea behind any posting that you do should be to drive people to your website. Okay? It still has to be the main focus of your advertising because that is always there. Posts on Twitter, uh, Facebook, LinkedIn, Eventually, they're gonna, you're going to have to scroll down so far, you'll never find them. So it has to be drive people to your website because that's where you're going to have the bulk of your information. Have a blog. What you write about doesn't have to be about square dancing. You can write about whatever you want, anything that will attract people, just that somewhere in there you might want to mention square dancing or somehow direct people to your website, which is where you tell them about square dancing. He suggested doing video blogs. You can say more in a minute or a minute and a half than most people can read in the same amount of time. Plus, when they see you and they are in 
you are in their face and it's just another reminder of who you are so they can put a face to you and your company and your business. Not only do you have to be online, you have to be mobile. And I think Justin might touch on this as the youth member here with uh, being in the 21st century. The example that he gave was an item that he posted that was viewed, he posted an item, it was viewed 1,500 times. Of that, 59 of them were viewed on a PC, which meant 1,451 were viewed on a mobile device. Smartphone, iPad, tablet. Whatever you write, don't, you don't need to sound eloquent. You need to sound like yourself so that when people meet you and you talk, it's like, oh, yeah, this is the person I feel like I know him because he, he sounds exactly like he writes. Okay, so now a very quick thing about what to say and what not to say. I'm only going to make one comment because I'm moderator. These guys are going to do all the talking. When you advertise for your next class, what do you say? I couldn't believe it the first time I heard that somebody had put on a poster asking people to sign up for 30 weeks of lessons. I mean, this was a long time ago, and it's like, it's no wonder they're not getting people. Like, who asks people to sign up for 30 weeks of lessons? Don't you just at, invite people to come out and square dance? Give them a good time so that they come back the next week? And give them a good time so that they come back the next week? And then after three or four, they're hooked, right? Don't invite them for 30 weeks. You know, unless you're doing it through an adult education thing and they have to sign up for a certain, and even those, the maximum are usually 10 weeks, right? And it's an introduction to sort of a thing. So anyway, don't say anything about how long the session is or that graduation is required before they can become part of the club. Get them out, give them a good time, they'll come back. That's the whole point. Anyway, that's all I'm going to say. Um, Mike. Very good. Thank you, Wendy. And Wendy is from Ottawa, Canada. So how about I stand for Wendy, our, our uh, moderator here? I'm just going to throw that on the ground here before we start. Um, basically, my section of here is, is, is the portion that we talk about creating compelling content because there's got to be a way that we communicate and, and some general guidelines that we follow in doing a blog or, or posting that that are going to help us reach our audience a little bit better. So just for a general overview, I'm basically saying, you know, know your audience. If you know who you're writing to, you've got a lot better chance of being able to communicate directly with them. Um, a lot of prominent marketeers um, teach copywriters to envis envision an audience of one, um, almost where you're writing in a conversational tone. It, it creates a sensation with the reader that, the piece is just for them. So I think we, we as a general look, we have to, to know the audience and, and think that you're writing directly to someone. Um, I also think that, that when you write a, a blog, if you can make whoever is reading that blog feel special, treating them like a preferred customer, um, that kind of thing, you, you got a better chance, again, of, of reaching that that person um, that's reading the, the article or connecting with them and keeping them in the, the mode of, of reading and completing to read your article, okay? Also, I think letting your reader get to know you. And as Wendy said, when you're talking, you're, you're, you're talking in, in your, normal, your normal tone. You're not trying to sound like anybody else but yourself. Um, also, valuing your reader's time. I think that you need to, to look at your article or look at your blog when you're done and, and, and get out, weed out the stuff that you don't absolutely need um, and cut it down to, to so, so you're just, you're just, cutting to the chase and, and you're not creating a lot of extra um, blah, 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 and a lot of extra fluff. And if you can give your reader, if you're asking them to do something or follow up on something, if you give them a timeline, you've got a much better chance of them taking action on uh, whatever it is you're, you're blogging or, or you're, you're writing about. Um, the other thing is, is for as far as um, quick tips about uh, writing, uh, about compelling writing, um, be useful. Um, if, you're, if your post isn't informing or inspiring or entertaining um, or making someone's life better, then don't publish it until it does. Look, look at a way of making that, that um, post.
post be useful? The other thing is share your opinion. Um, your, your opinions are often what sets bloggers apart, and, and I think it's okay to share your opinion and, and, and be yourself. And as I said previously, cut out the fluff You know, before you hit that publish thing. Look through it and revise the post so that it doesn't contain a lot of, a lot of blah, blah, blah that doesn't really add any value to what you're writing about. And, again, visualize your reader. Um, if you if you write with your reader in mind, you got a much better chance of making that that content. Um, make your post scannable. Um, only 16% of people that that read every word online form. If you format your posts so that certain main points stand out, you got a much better chance of 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 having that that post be read and and people reading the whole thing. Um, the other thing is 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 know your your headline. Um, if you can if you can have a headline that that captures people, you got a much much better chance. And I'll elaborate that on, on just a second. Um, the other thing is is when you write, write with passion. Um, if you if you care, if you're excited about your subject, whatever it is, you got much better chance of hooking whoever's reading that into reading the entire thing. Um, um, give your readers something to do next. We were talking about that even in the general overview of, of, of having them complete something, um, sign up for something, or if you're giving something away, that's even, that's even better. Um, a, telling stories in, in a blog or in, a, in an article or in a post is a really neat thing too because I think if you can relate a story, give people a visual a hook about what you're writing about, you've got a much better chance of not only communicating with, with them but them remembering what they read afterwards as well. Okay, so stories are good. Um, if you can give your post visual appeal, um, an eye-catching image, something like that on there. I think our new Square Dance logo is kind of slick. Um, if you haven't seen Jim, see Jim. He's got badges, and and, and, and that new logo is is uh, is. Is, is kind of eye-catching. I, I, I think it's a, it's a really nice step forward. Um, also, uh, the, the best way to improve your writing is to practice. I mean, keep practice. Keep working at it and, uh, and keep that going because I think you'll find yourself just getting better and better at it as time goes along. Um, the other thing I wanted to cover was, was um, a headline. Uh, in order to be able to capture somebody to read what you're writing in the first place, you have to have a headline that, that kind of grabs them and, 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 and pulls them in. And there's different ways of, of putting this, these headlines together. Sometimes you can say, um, as I've written on the handout here, that, that, that if you say the, the number of something about something, in other words, if you say like 10 sec- secrets to a more magnetic copy, um, seven ways to improve your writing, you know, dot, 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 right now. Um, in other words, formatting in such a way that, that you say uh, blank of blank about blank and, or something like um, what blank can teach you about blank, you know, um, uh, something like uh, I think a good example would be uh, the, the Mad Men's Guide to Changing the World with Words, you know, something like that. Uh, if, if you can have a headline that hooks people, you got much, a much better chance of, of them even reading what you, what you write. So the key is, is hooking your reader, and that, that headline is one of the big things that, that helps to hook your reader, okay? Okay. Um, there's also uh, another little blip that I posted in there about about the f- the five sections of an awesome post or article, and, and basically it's it's pretty self-explanatory. Again, hook your reader. Um, you have to have an issue. Um, explain in more detail the issue that causes this, you know, that that that, that ties it into the hook. Um, have an underlying cause. Um, there's a, also a solution. Sometimes a solution to an issue that that you're writing about is really key. Um, in other words, if you're if you're saying that that in your blog that 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 you're offering them something to to uh, be able to get off the couch or be able to to get their blood moving again, and and you have that solution is is come out and, and dance with us, um, then then you're you're tying that together and, and you're making your your content more compelling. Um, and like I said, I think if, if the best thing you can do in writing is to keep it brief, keep it to the point, and once again, practice and practice and practice until you, until you get that right. Any questions? I think that's pretty straightforward. How many publish or b- blog or, or write anything? And, all right, a few people do, yeah, very good. Very good. I think s- any any comments from those that do write regular blogs or that you want might want to make a, a comment? Also, put your, your name and your, where you're from. 
Barry McCombs, Calgary, Alberta, Canada. There's one elaboration on what Mike just said uh, when I was having to review medical literature. One was that that headline will make them read the first sentence. Hopefully, if you have a good first sentence, it'll make them read the first paragraph, and by then you may have them hooked. Absolutely right, Barry. Any, any other comments? Let me run, a, run the mic out. The one thing I know is a writer, Bruce Holmes from Evanston, Illinois. The one thing I know as a writer is that what I wrote one day is going to look very different the next day. So I never, ever do anything just done and it's gone, it's out the door. You write, you put it aside, you come back the next day, you find out you've got sentences there that don't even mean anything to you. You, you have to give yourself distance and perspective on your writing and be willing to edit and go over it and come back a week later and read it one more time before you send it out because it will get better if you give it time and perspective. Good thought. Anybody else? All right. Well, let's turn this over to Justin. And uh, Justin's got his computer hooked up. And so here we go. So I was just going to uh, run down the list a little bit. And then I want to, since we actually have the projector I'll show you some of the stuff that I have been doing. Um, Caller Lab's focus here lately has been on social media, but that's not the only way that you can communicate online. So I kind of broke down um, seven different ways that you can communicate online, and uh, some of this is, I just kind of pulled it off uh, to start a, a conversation. But ways to communicate, uh, email and email newsletters. Um, so it can be I send an email to Mike or I send an email to this whole group, all I would need is your email address, um, and it's kind of like an old school way to communicate on the internet, uh, but it's kind of a top-down approach, so it's not very good for dialogue um, or creating a conversation, um, but the great thing about uh, sending emails um, is that it's right there in front of them. They don't have to go and look uh, for your information. It's just right there. One of the cons to it is as soon as they hit delete, it's gone. Um, and so it's not the, the most permanent way uh, to have your message out there. Uh, two is forums. It can be is like an email forum or uh, where you actually go to a site, you create a username and password, and then you're on that website uh, talking to other people. I think it's less of a top-down um, conversation, um, and it's more interactive. Um, but SD callers, I think, would be a good um, forum type. Uh, we talk, Wendy uh, talked about the blog. Um, it's just an online journal. It can be uh, anywhere from like a personal diary or a tutorial. Uh, I have tons of ideas for what I think a, a, a good blog would be, whether we're just talking about styling, whether we're just talking about teaching tips uh, for beginners. I think in Square Dancing, there's a lot of things that you could blog about, um, you know, if we all had more time to, to do it. Uh, the website... It's a semi-permanent home. I think that's the great thing about having a website that people can go out and they can look for you. Um, usually everything that I send out as like a newsletter type, I also try to include on the website. So if they want to go back and read what we did six months ago, if they want to go back and read what we did a year ago, uh, I like to put that on the, uh, on the website. Um, some things that you'd also want to include is just a biography, a schedule, promotional picture, uh, talk about your home programs, and always link it to other things. There's a lot of great resources out there, like You Two Can Dance, Where's the Dance, do -si do So have them linked uh, all together. Uh, social media, I think we've been talking a lot about that this week. Um, and then in newspapers, a lot of uh, the traditional newspapers now have an online segment. There is a ton of things that you can do for that because newspapers are hungry for good content. Uh, I was talking in one of the other panels that uh, I hear a lot that they say, well, I invited a reporter and a cameraman to come out uh, to take pictures, but they didn't show up. Well, we don't even have to do that anymore. We can write the article. We can take the pictures and send it to them. And I guarantee you it ends up... Uh, on their sites. Sometimes it takes a while. Uh, we did a dance in April. I sent it in to the newspaper. It didn't show up until like September, um, but it still usually ends up. Uh, for those, take good colored photos. Um, what are some other suggestions? If you are new to writing, one of the things I would suggest is to uh, go to Google. 
go to Google News, and then you can type in whatever you want to talk about. In this case, it would be square dancing. And it would pull up every article written on that, on that subject, on square dancing. And so you can read across the country uh, what different people are saying about it, and that will give you a good clue on what to say. You can figure out um, things you want to include, some things that you don't want to say. And so I think it's a good, I've read dozens and dozens um, just to kind of get a blueprint page. Uh, YouTube, I think, is a great version. The cool thing about YouTube is that it can be anywhere from I pull out my iPhone and I take a video and I throw it up there, or, you know, you can spend thousands of dollars and have the lighting and have the sound, so it can be as amateur as you want or, you know, as sophisticated as professional. I would say start with uh, Facebook. Uh, how many people have Facebook? I mean, is there anybody that doesn't have Facebook? Uh, a couple, okay. Um, I think just in general, just in life, it's good to have a Facebook. Put square dancing aside, I think it's just a good way to communicate. Um, we have a Facebook group for my club, and uh, Barry was asking in the other one. I gave away all my secrets in the, in the other one. Um, but a good way to, uh, to communicate the square dance stuff is to have a page just for that. So you're not eating up all of your personal, um, your space with just square dancing. Because sometimes it can get old if, if you have a friend that cares nothing about it. All they see is just you posting about this one topic over and over again. So it might be better to move it to a, a fan page or a group page. Um, have a plan. Mike was talking about that earlier. Have a clear idea. And it might be multiple ideas. It might be multiple plans. But just uh, know who your audience is going to be. One of the first things that I focused on was um, how to get as many people in my neighborhood, in my suburbs, uh, to be aware of square dancing. Uh, that was my first goal, and so I kind of reached out in different ways. And then it became, uh, how do I get them more involved? How do I get them talking about it? Stay focused and be consistent. Um, I call it uh, uh, internet litter, but we have a ton of websites out there that shows uh, calling schedules from 2009. Or, you know, has uh, clubs that had folded, you know, five years ago. And so if you put something out there, you know, just make sure it stays up to date. Make sure the numbers are good, the email addresses are good. Um, know your personal brand. I think this is important. Everybody, whether you think about it or not, has a personal brand. Um, whether you... Some examples I was thinking about earlier was uh, Jerry Story, if you're a sea dancer. Uh, Jerry Story is the only caller I know that calls... Um, I guess it's an A, cast a shadow. He calls it cast a shatter, but he's the only person that I know, and I always think about that. One of the things that uh, my dancers know is that at the end of the dance, I always say, thank you for coming and thank you for staying, but it's just routine. Everybody knows that I'll say that. Um, so whatever that is for you personally, uh, whether it's like wardrobe or symbol or something that you always say, everybody has a personal brand, so think about that uh, on your sites. Pictures, uh, Statistics even show this. Pictures are really better than a thousand words. When it comes to social media, 87% of all the interaction on Facebook is, happens around a photo post. So if I was to get on Facebook and say, Mike Seastrom and I are doing a uh, panel on social media, uh, it would get some traction. But if I took a picture of the two of us in front of all of you saying, wish us luck, uh, that would get 10 times more traction. It would get more likes. It would get more shares. More people would comment on it. So just keep that in mind when it comes to your classes. Uh, and a call to action is really important. Uh, I do a uh, email newsletter, and I use uh, MailChimp. I don't know if anybody's heard of, of Okay, pretty much everybody, right? Uh, it can be, oh, <laughs> um, it's free. And you can MailChimp. M-A-I-L, MailChimp, and uh, you can use it as an uh, email newsletter. So instead of just typing up an email and sending it, you can use this program. It's free. You have to come up with a username and a password. Um, but then you can be as creative as you want in these, um, in these emails. And so you can add pictures. You can add color. You can add, like, different boxes. Uh, you can have... Uh, boxes that say click here to go to this site. Uh, it can be as fancy as you want to. 
when I first started using, I would spend hours just coming up with a simple email. The more you use it, the easier it is. Um, but it's free, and it's just a little more appealing and eye-catching. But on one of my emails, I said, uh, I was talking about the Nationals in Little Rock, and I sent it to the Memphis dancers trying to get them to commit to go into the Nationals in Little Rock. And so I came up, somebody was talking about uh, waiting a day and then reading it again before you send it out. So I, this whole email goes out about the, the reasons to go to a national convention. And then at the very bottom, for some reason, I said, uh, the state convention's also coming up two months later, and I put the website for the uh, state convention. Sent out the email. Oh, here's the other good thing about MailChimp, is that you can see how many people opened the email, how many people clicked on the different links. Um, there's a couple other features, too. Uh, but instead of having, I think, 120 people open the email, who knows if they read it, they might have just opened and deleted it. Um, but of the 120 people that opened it, half went to the Little Rock site, and a little bit less than half went to the Tennessee site. So I didn't have one clear call to action. I think I would have had a better result if I just put one website. So live and learn. I talk about like mixing it up and trying new things. Um, we do like a poll the audience, um, you know, what's your favorite singing call? Or uh, it can be as silly as what's your uh, favorite season? Or, you know, just to get people engaged. You can get images, again, off of Google that's almost like a fill in the blank. Um, we had bad weather in win uh, this past winter. So uh, one of the things, it had a, a picture of the beach, and it says, you know, I wish I was blank. And I just put that out on Facebook, and you would be surprised, like, how many people came in and took the time to post, and uh, somebody just got back from Ireland, and somebody was going to go to Ireland, and so they were like, oh, we should talk about, you know, it just kind of drives the conversation. That one kind of worked. I say, uh, know and use your symbols. Um, hashtag, does everybody know the difference between, like, a hashtag and the et sign? Okay, well, let's go over it for the non-believers. Uh, the pound sign, that little hashtag, it creates it um, a searchable word. And so you usually I always end it with a hashtag square dance. So then you can go up to the top and hit search, uh, hashtag square dance. Maybe I should just show that. Um, so I'll skip that for just a second. Start slow, run a marathon. Don't go out today and start a Twitter and a Instagram and a Facebook and try to uh, start a blog. You know, take it slow. I always say don't be the hard seller. Um, everybody has that friend on Facebook that's trying to get you to buy the latest product and you see it over and over again. And that's just kind of a turnoff. So I wouldn't advise doing that. And then I talked about the, uh, the online articles. And then to wrap it up, on Twitter, let's see if I can get this pulled up. On Twitter, I talk about some of the examples, and I put, on Twitter, it has to be less than 140 characters. Let's see. Does anybody know how this works? Here, here it comes. So here's my Twitter feed. And so you'll see that uh, I'm following 286 people, 189 people are following me. Uh, one of the things that I try to do is um, list reasons to dance. So I say, uh, as if you need another reason to dance, and then it goes into the statistics um, that it reduces the risk of dementia, dancing reduces stress and depression, it increases energy. We can kind of scroll down a little bit. And I said, I picked out some things tonight for the Top Spinners uh, food drive. I did the hashtag for Fayette Cares. So if I was to click on that, it would take me uh, to everything that's ever been said on Twitter about Fayette Cares. Yeah. Uh, he asked about, uh, I guess it's kind of hard for the people that are listening to it. Uh, so it's just an image. No, I found this. Someone uh, probably sent it to me. And so I just uh, retweeted it. You can see down here uh, the three. Uh, that means three other people has uh, retweeted it. They've sent it back out. I didn't create that image, though, no. Microphone, please. This is a wonderful example of how things can get around you. You create an image like this, and suddenly a lot of people have seen it. 
um, for the people that are listening, go to my Twitter and you can see this. Um, there's uh, one person has liked it, three other people have shared it. Um, I do a lot of these uh, reasons to dance, so this is number 11. I write, it's scary, just kidding. To step outside of your normal routine can be uncomfortable, but embrace it. Um, and then I just sh usually show, if you click on the image, it kind of brings it up a little bit. But this is, uh, this is my Twitter feed. Um, this is my actual website that you can go to, um, justin-russell.com. And so the main page, I always, on the bottom left-hand corner, I put whatever the big upcoming event is. Uh, this is a WordPress, so this is also free. You got to pay for the domain name. Uh, this one's probably a little uh, more advanced than uh, some, but again, this is kind of a free site that you can go to. Um, I probably pay... $12 a month for the domain. Um, it has my home program. I have a little uh, snippet here uh, for beginners. So if you're a non-dancer that wanted to come, it has a little bit of writing. Mike put uh, said an important thing that uh, if you bold, put in bold what you really want the readers to read, a lot of people will just kind of scan through this and then move on to the next page. But I think Mike has a good idea that if you uh, put in bold what you really want people to read, uh, right here the cursor says a list of some of the health benefits, that should probably be in bold and then uh, people would read that faster before they just jump to the next page like I'm about to do. This is our meetup group. Um, Top Spinner Square Dance Club, you can go to uh, meetup.com and set up your own group. Um, we pay as a sponsor uh, or as an organizer, you pay a monthly fee. Uh, depending on how long you, um, you book it for, whether it's three months, six months, or a year, dictates the price. And I think it's about $10 a month. But you can see over here in the left-hand side, beginner dancers, uh, we have 62 people that are on the site. Um, so every time I set up a new meetup, that email goes to 62 people. You can kind of scroll down just a little bit, and it says six beginners came to the last dance on March 6th. Usually those numbers are kind of inaccurate, um, but then it puts a little blurb on learn more. Free dance night, a Tennessee dance sampler for beginners, uh, dance from 7 to 8. Uh, as we go through the basic steps in both square and line dancing, um, that's a little sales pitch there. On Facebook, this is our Facebook page. We have 237 likes. Um, you can see all the different friends that are down. Hunter Keller is a friend on here. Elmer Sheffield just came through, and I said, rain or not, we're excited to welcome Elmer to the Memphis area tonight. Hope to see you there. Um, usually these pictures get uh, more responses. Um, we were closed for snow. There was one other thing I wanted to show on here. We, I spent $60 on a um, Google um, advert, not Google, Facebook advertising. And so from that, I was able to narrow down the search to my local area, um, and you pay per click. So uh, you can see here 17,568. Uh, this is how many times it, uh, it went out. So it showed up on 17,000 people's Facebook page. Uh, usually it's up at the top. It's a promotional thing. Uh, from that, 21 people uh, liked it. Uh, one person shared it. And uh, in the data, it gives you a little email to see how many people actually click to go to your site. Uh, you pay per click. Um, usually, as the 17,000 people show, usually people just kind of scroll on through it. Uh, but we've gotten people that way. Yeah. And then that's the end of that. Um, one more thing and I'll be finished. Uh, the bottom back on the sheet uh, says it's a list of reasons to dance. Uh, every year uh, we start a class in September and we start a class in February. The February one, kind of our uh, little marketing ploy, is to say uh, New Year's resolutions. So everybody has that New Year's resolution. They want to learn something new. They want to be more active. They want to meet friends, uh, whatever it is. And so that's kind of how we offer the uh, February classes. And uh, so I listed out here, entertainment, socialization, get out of the house, exercise, learn something, and family time. And the little paragraph be be below it 
says, what if we could find one super activity which accomplishes everything on your to-do list all at the same time? It would be awesome. Can you imagine how free and simple your calendar would be if you could check everything off your weekly to-do list with just one activity? And then, you know, you kind of go in, come out Thursday night and, and give it a whirl. So, and then uh, that has all of my s- different sites, but we kind of went through most of them. So that's all, that's all I got. Okay, just a reminder that if you want to stay afterwards, if you want a Facebook account or see about setting one up, anything that has to do with social media, just hang around. We'll be willing to help. Uh, but any questions? Any questions, comments? Uh, Mike's going to run around with the uh, microphone. Brian Freed from Minnesota. You might want to add, um, I assume you might have known Justin, you can tie in your Facebook and your Twitter to the same when I update my Facebook fan page, it updates my Twitter account. You can also tie it into a blog. You can tie it in with WordPress, and it's a very nice thing. You can update you update your blog. It updates your Facebook fan page. And so, in other words, you only have to do it once, and usually it gets sent out there. And you'd find that on the site Hootsuite. Is that the one? Right? Hootsuite? Okay. I, guess I just set mine up. I mean, you know, when you set up a... Facebook fan page, um, there is a one of the things that you can check is I want to update, you know, update Twitter. And H O O T S U I T E. Somebody had a hand up here. Sue White from Arkansas. I don't understand some of the terminology for Facebook. For instance, the difference between a profile, a page, a fan page, uh, a group, uh, help. I'll just stay over here. But um, So a lot of it, we were talking about the same thing, whether we're talking about a page or a profile, uh, that's the same. Okay. So uh, right here is the Top Spinners Square Dance Club. So this is a group. Uh, If I wanted to, I could have a Justin Russell Square Dance Caller page. It could be like a fan page. Um, There's a little bit of difference. I can just tell you personally, um, I'd rather have these groups. Um, I just prefer it. We could... Yeah, it's pointless to kind of go into the difference. Um, But then also, if we click over here, this will take you back to my profile. So Justin Russell has a page. um, And then also I have the Top Spinners uh, group. And, And the good thing about having the group is that only the people that subscribe to it would see the updates Uh, on Facebook. So you can kind of avoid sending uh, stuff out to people that don't really care about it. Um, A normal Facebook page, you know, that an individual would have, Truly, you are limited to 5,000 friends. Now, I don't have 5,000 friends. I don't know of anybody who really does. I mean, except I suppose, you know, Madonna maybe does. But, uh, you know, but, okay, a fan page or a group is unlimited. You could conceivably have, I mean, and you go look at Garth Brooks's Facebook fan page, and he has, you know, 18 bazillion people. Okay, 18 million, you know, fans. So you are limited on your personal page to 5,000 people. A fan page, you are not limited. And plus, it's a great way to keep your stuff separate. So if you already had a Facebook page and you really felt like, you know, that was maybe your square dancing and your personal content, you'd be better off to create a fan page for square dancing. You can, and it's very easy to do it. So we can help you here. I'm here. Lawrence is here. I think there's one more. Barry Johnson is supposed to be here. And we can help you if you want to set one up. Roy Goddard, in New Jersey. So, I mean, I have a personal Facebook page. Um, 
And so if I want to set up, say, a, a Facebook page, say Betsy got a square dance caller, be more like her professional Facebook page. But then if I wanted to set up a fan page for Betsy got a square dance caller, uh, would that be a separate account or would that be something that would be um, another form of that uh, professional page? Once, once you have your own personal page, it allows you to go in and create a fan page or a group page, but that you can do that right from your own from your own page. Lawrence Johnstone, Ukiah, California. Also, one difference between a Facebook page where you're creating a fan page or a page for an organization as opposed to your own personal profile. Your profile is a page, but it's tied only to you. A pa another page that you create is separate. A group as opposed to a page is a... If you've ever heard of an email group or an email list where you can have people join the group and send messages to it and everybody in the group sees it, that's a similar idea to a Facebook group. The difference between a Facebook group and a Facebook page is that in a group, any member of the group can post a message and they all see it. But on a Facebook page, only the person who owns the page can post messages that show up on the main page itself. If somebody who just likes the page and is following it posts a message, if you look at the page, it's shoved off to the side in a small print where m most people don't see it. And only the page owner's messages show up in the main area. But on a group, anything anybody who's a member of a group posts gets seen by all. Any other questions? Is that making any sense, Sue? <coughs> Getting there? Good. Barry McCombs, uh, Calgary, Alberta. Justin mentioned that you use the uh, WordPress, and it sounded like that was the free version. I also understand that there is WordPress software that you can download. Did you have any, anyone have any comparison on those two? I have a comment. This is Dennis Clark from Indiana. Um, response to Barry. Barry sorry. Um, I use WordPress for three websites that I, I manage. And um, there are different varieties or flavors of WordPress. There are those free, uh, free packages, uh, one of which he uses. Um, there are others that there is a cost to, normally about $45. Um, and the the most expensive one I've seen is $50. Uh, it just depends on what you want to do, what, what type you want. But uh, there are a lot of excellent WordPress applications uh, for, for the web uh, that are free. And they are very, very good. It's just that I have some specialized websites that I deal with. One of the reasons for my questions is I'm using, for my own personal web site that I've had for almost 20 years now, I'm using an ancient program called Front Page that is now no longer supported. And uh, I don't feel like paying a very large amount to Adobe for getting Dreamweaver. Okay, there, Chris Jensen from uh, New Mexico. WordPress.com provides hosted WordPress installations. There is a free version, and then you can pay a set amount per year to uh, do that. And WordPress.com, you could take a domain name and then link to that, or you can just use WordPress.com slash the name of your blog. And it provides both the WordPress software and the hosting. And you get limited uh, some themes that WordPress.com likes, and you can choose one of those themes. If you pay money, you get more flexibility in what you can do with that. 
You can also go to WordPress.org, WordPress.org, and get the software, which you can then install on some other computer that could host the WordPress blog. So, for example, what I do is I pay, um, I have a internet provider um, where I'm paying X dollars a month, and on there I have a WordPress installation that a lot of the um, providers, the web hosting people, will have an automatic way of setting that up. So you can just click a button and it will install WordPress for you. And then you have total control over that. You're paying the web host for a monthly fee to host that WordPress um, installation. And you have total control over what you want to do. You can install any theme. You can do whatever you want. WordPress.com, on the other hand, is more limited. Um, they are they have uh, they host it themselves, so they control what you can do and not do. Karen Patterson, New Mexico. So on the WordPress sites that allow you to build a web page, do they have the capability of uploading video and audio and all that kind of thing onto those sites, or are they strictly static? Um, they're not strictly static in the sense that they're bl it's blogging software. So, you know, there are ways of entering blogs and things like that. They also, you can put in links to video, um, to video that you either host yourself or that you host on, um, like YouTube. I think the easiest way to do video these days is to upload it to YouTube and then you can put in a link on your site that not only that links to that video but also provides a a viewport where you can show the video right on your website and that's that's probably the easiest way to do video yes also there was a comment about Justin you were going to show something about hashtags i'm just going to mention i use dreamweaver which is the very expensive program from Adobe. And unless you want to spend a big chunk of your life, go with something simple like the things we've been talking about. Don't feel you have to get the best because that will make you cooler. It will just eat up a lot of your time. And, and it's kind of fun. you got a lot of freedom, but you pay a price for it. All right. Justin? So real quick, I was just going to show, uh, this is an example of where I did hashtag square dancing. And so you can click on this, and now this takes you to anybody's site uh, that has put uh, hashtag square dancing in. Uh, usually I'll go ahead and, and tell you that uh, people will just be having a line dance party, and they'll put hashtag square dancing. So it's not uh, limited to just uh, what we think of. What's that? Oh, this is on Twitter. Sorry. Uh, and so you can see, oh, they're talking about square dancers in China. They're not talking about modern square dancers. They're talking about people that dance in the square. Um, and so you can see, uh, let's see if we can scroll down just a little bit and actually find. Um, so here's somebody, Lori. Um, no better way to end uh, this conference tonight than square dancing. And so it was probably like a contra dance. Um, but anyway, this is just a great example of how another China. Well, I know Nick, and so this is actually a uh, what we would consider modern square dancing. Let's see if we can scroll down just a little bit. Oh, so this is talking about the probably the uh, Northwest Pacific uh, teen competition. Uh, and this is kind of a great way that I've actually met friends or, you know, started talking to other people um, uh, using this um, but all we, I did was do the hashtag, the number sign, and then square dancing. Uh, the other thing, if you'll go over this uh, scroller right here, the at sign, that would go to your personal profile. So I think mine is at J.D. Russell. Uh, so that's the difference between the at sign and the, the hashtag. So what we're saying is if you, if you put, post a picture and, or even a blog or anything and you just hashtag square dancing, it's going to turn up on 
I mean, other people will have the access to it or to see it. Anybody on Twitter? You know, on anybody Twitter. Anybody with a Twitter account, then in the search in the search box, you just put hashtag square dancing and anybody that's ever written that in a Twitter feed. So it's it really focused up. around Twitter. Yes. I and the last last session, um, Chris um, Stephen was showing ha- hashtag square dancing, but he he pulled it off another site tag was it tagboard tagboard and 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 he just went into tagboard.com i believe and then did hashtag square dancing and pulled up i think everything um to do with square dancing and he, yeah tagboard there it is and yeah just Hashtag type, hashtags, probably hashtag type square dancing. Oh, you don't need it. Okay. All right. <clears throat> and then he was loading the posts and the, there, was, there was quite a few things on there. And I, and I don't think they're exclusively in this. I don't think they're exclusively to Twitter. It, there's Pinterest. There's Facebook. It, yeah. Instagram. Yeah. So it shows a lot. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. And this is Sue White with a follow-up question. So the hashtag is usable for any social media. I don't understand when you use hashtag. Any time. Any time. Any time that you write something, like here on, on this tag board, they did a search for square dancing. So if you want people to find what you're writing about square dancing, put hashtag square dancing, and then when they do the search for that, what you wrote will come up. So, so they don't necessarily have to be, if, if you wanted to write that on, on your Facebook account, or if you were posting something on Facebook, and it was a picture of a dance that you guys were at, or, or, or something of that nature, or that or calling or whatever, and at, at the end of it, just put, or someplace in the body of your message, put down hashtag score dancing, all one word, it's going to show up on this tag board. Yeah. You have another question, Sue? It looks like you were ready to ask. That. I think we had a question over here. Claudia, did you have your hand up? No. Okay. Anybody? Barbara Steele, Massachusetts. I just wanted to clarify for her, when you say put hashtag square dancing what you mean is to include the character hashtag, which is that pound sign, square dancing, in whatever you're typing. You literally type that in as part of the message that you posted, whether you're posting to Twitter, Pinterest, Facebook, or whatever. So that's what they mean by put hashtag. Yeah. Hashtag, no space. You're literally typing those, that word, that character string as and you're including that as part of your post. Yeah. Hashtag no space. Yeah. Any other comments? Any questions specifically about how to write or content? Just I noticed a lot of your things have beginners on them. And and interesting because we've we've in, in the last several years have tried to stray away from that and call them new dancers. I don't know whether that would make any difference in your numbers or anything like that. It would be interesting to, to see. Yeah, yeah, because it, it, we we we've had felt for a while that maybe that was that term that people didn't want to be a beginner. They didn't mind being a new dancer, but they want to be a beginner. Whether that really makes a lot of a difference, I'm, I'm not really sure. Roy got again. I've just been playing around with Facebook and whatever while we're talking, and of course now my head's exploding. But question, because I was assumed that the hashtag was a, a Twitter only sort of thing so um, but I just tried on my um, Facebook search I put in the hashtag square dancing and I got um, a lot of the same stuff so if I'm posting something uh, on Facebook and in, in, in the post where I'm writing it out and I'll say had a great time hashtag square dancing at such and such festival then will that show up in a hashtag or tag board search cool that's a nice thing to know. How about hashtag round dancing? Well, I'm, <laughs> but I'm, but I'm thinking. I, I, you know, I, I would imagine that. 
I would like to point out something on the screen, if I may. This is Dennis from Indiana again. I'm hearing some whispers in the background. Can you go back to that slide that you just had or the picture you just had up? Um, I I'm, was hearing some questions in my ears in the back about what to type and, and how to type it and the questions coming up. Um, the question of what to type, where to put it, and Mike said someplace in the body of it, okay? It doesn't have to be at the end. It doesn't have to be at the beginning. And what you type is exactly what you see here. And it comes out blue here because once you put it in, it's like a link, okay? It looks like a, a hyperlink, okay? But it's exactly what you see here, the hashtag or the pound sign, which is shift number two if I remember right, square dancing, okay, with no spaces or anything else. And it's the same thing here. Somebody had, oh, well, this one is, okay, hashtag army. So that would be something about they were in the army or something else. Um, they put hashtag square dancing and hashtag trending Tuesday. So trending Tuesday means something else to this person. So every hashtag and something with it means something, and it goes along with it. One thing to keep in mind is that hashtags, they can be serious, like square dancing. Like, we literally want people to, to do that. But it can also be funny. So I could say that I'm here, and I could do hashtag teaching old dogs new tricks. And so obviously, uh, you know, it's just supposed to be like a joke. But uh, a, lot of a lot of times you'll see uh, that also as a hashtag. And it's supposed to be more funny than, um, you know, doing a hashtag square dancing or round dancing. Barry McCombs, Calgary. Uh, I notice here that the square dancing is capitalized. Is the hashtag, ca um, sorry, is it case sensitive when you're entering it? I don't, I don't believe it is. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. I think easier to read that. Sometimes when you capitalize things that are running together like that, it's a little bit easier to read and you can avoid people misinterpreting things. Okay. Any other questions? We still have... You notice that the post that had hashtag square dancing with this capital S and capital D showed up, even though when Justin typed the search square dancing into the tag board, he used all lowercase. So that, to me, means it's not case sensitive. It's looking either way. And, of course, up in that upper right-hand corner, it's showing you where those posts were, whether it's Facebook or Twitter or Instagram down here. Great. How many have websites here? Nice. Nice. How many have Instagram accounts? If you have grandkids, you probably have Instagram. <laughs> yeah, I have an Instagram. Yeah, yeah. My my grandson, of course, put me on Instagram. Yeah. yeah. So how many have? Uh, once again, how many have Facebook? Just about everybody. Uh, how many have Twitter? Mm, just about half. LinkedIn? Just about, about the same people have. <laughs> so it seems to be that once you get on one, you get on. LinkedIn, by the way, is more of a business oriented. So it's a good idea for callers to have a LinkedIn page because people might be looking for people in that field. So it's more of a business uh, connection to connect with people in like businesses. Um, Twitter is more social. Pinterest, uh, Instagram, they're more of a social, just to keep in touch kind of a thing. We still have 15 minutes. Any, Sue. Sue White from Arkansas. I have a question about MailChimp. Uh, we were told that it was an email newsletter free program. So what? <laughs> Oh, okay. Because I, I have used it. And it is it is free as long as you keep it under like 10,000 emails a month. I, there, there's a limit, okay, I mean, to send out free. But the beauty of that thing is, is you once you create your account, okay, you can import your 
emails that you want to send out, okay, you can create a, and Justin will back me up because I know he uses it, um, you can create themes. If you want to do something where you're sending out, let's say, to your dancers, on I'm going to send out my October, you know, newsletter, and you want to do it that way, well, you can choose an orange theme. You can add in, you know, you can add in a, a pumpkin or whatever it is that you want, and it will show up. Um, the beauty about that is, A, it does not come from you. It comes on your behalf, but the return email address is MailChimp, but it says on behalf of, and then if somebody decides they don't want it, all they got to do is they click this an unsubscribe button and their email is removed and it's in instantaneous you can have there is a button that people can share so if I get your email or your newsletter and I want to share it with somebody I can click share and send it on to them and if they want to sign up there's a little button for you to, you know for them to add their email address Hang on a second. Hang on. So this is a, a MailChimp email, and then this is actually one of the more basic ones because you can do a background picture if you want, but uh, all you have to do is copy and paste. So I drug this picture in. I have this picture, this image, and then it's uh, spring 2014. Uh, I just have like a little blurb of uh, Caller Lab. This is actually last year. As I scroll down, I put in a new image. Uh, that's Hunter and I. We called a dance uh, last year. Um, down here and so uh, I use this I think it's just like a fancier way I just think it's a, a easier way to kind of put images I think you can I don't know if I set this up uh, this could um, you can click on this and it would make a printable full page um, you can click on these hyperlinks and it would take you to the 63rd um, website um, down here at the bottom this is always there uh, and then it also has a way where you can connect to my uh, Facebook, connect to Twitter. You can put uh, a forward to a friend. So all that information. So that's uh, what a MailChimp email would look like. And that's uh, one of the more basic ones. Yeah. And it's MailChimp, M-A-I-L-C-H-I-M-P. Chimp. Chimp. Dennis Clark, Indiana. Um, I started using MailChimp with our state convention. I was in charge of registration. Um, actually, our church uses it, and I learned about it from them. Um, but the reason I started was, uh, number one, was to, um, it, it was a much better way to track um, the people who were at the at the convention the year before and getting information out about registration and encourage them, encouraging them to register for uh, the 25th. Um, I then decided to start using it. Uh, I am involved in an advanced group um, or calling for an advanced group now, uh, and I have two other clubs. Uh, started using it for that uh, so that I could send one email out uh, for a newsletter uh, talking uh, to all three groups at one time. And I am the president of our association now, and I am sending out a newsletter to them using the same thing. And I don't have to fight with all the contacts uh, in my regular email. Uh, the other part of it is it is so much easier to do the graphics in it with the templates that they provide and getting the graphics in. It's compressed so that the email, whatever email provider the people are using, and even if some of them are using um, uh, the old copper system of getting email, again, it's compressed. Uh, the graphics are compressed so that they can see them and see them quickly. Uh, rather than waiting forever for the graphics to download. Dennis, and all you have to do is import the email list that you want to send it to. And, and Okay, okay, very good. Say again, the question, what the comment was? I have five distribution lists in my current single MailChimp account uh, for different groups that it goes out to. Very good. Yes, Susan. 
Uh, Susan Morris from Redmond, Washington. Um, I send out a weekly newsletter to my class that I also then put on my website. And so I was going to go to MailChimp this year, but I couldn't figure out a way to put it on my website too. Is that possible? Wait, wait. Mike's getting okay. a workout. Yeah. Um, so on Club News, if you click here, um, this this shows. I just copy and pasted though, so I don't know if there is a way. And Chris, if you're familiar with, okay, then yes, uh, then that's the way I I do it. Yeah. I haven't had a lot of experience with it, but it's same copy and paste seems to be the one. It'll pick up the graphics as well. It will. All right, so yeah, pick up the graphics and the and the words with a copy and paste. Yes, Sue. Go ahead, Sue. Sue White with another follow up question. Um, when you use Mailchimp, this shows up in the person's personal email. Yes. Yes. So would you, if you were communicating to your club members? about canceling a dance. Would you use MailChimp or would you use just regular personal to, email? To cancel a dance, you'd probably use regular email because that would be quicker because you do take time to set up the the mail in MailChimp. It Thank does you. take a little bit of time. Thank you. Yeah. But as you use it, it gets easier and easier to use MailChimp, right? Oh, yes. Yes, yes. definitely. But, but if you wanted to have something special or, you know, a flyer type thing yeah. or an announcement the, or a newsletter or an invitation. The thing about MailChimp is it makes it look nice. It's more eye-appealing. People will want to read it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's because pretty it slick. Draws, that, it draws the eye. That top spinners yeah. thing, Justin, is, is pretty slick. Very, very eye-catching and it looks very professional. This might be the last comment. We're, now we're running out of time. Now, nobody's mentioned, but uh, one of the things that you can't do if you're sending lots of emails out is you, you need to identify – what that the people you're sending it to are people that are really supposed to be on your list. You're not just blasting things. And so that's one of the issues. And I didn't happen to see that note automatically on your bottom of your thing. So you may still have to put that in there yourself. It was there. Which, which I did. The unsubscribe? Yeah. The, yes, no, it was. Not, not just an unsubscribe, but why are they, in fact, getting the email in the first place? Are they really legitimately a member? But the second one is your emails, your email supplier your uh, may, like MSN may very well limit you to some number. So I send a thousand emails two, three, four times a month, and I have to send them two hundred at a time. Yeah. That's right? if you go through email. Mailchimp yeah. does not have That's those what restrictions. I'm That's the value yeah. of, e of yes. Mailchimp is that you can put a lot of them in there, and they're not send it coming all at once. out of your account. Yeah. Yes. Right. Ten thousand. 10,000, Dennis Clark, Indiana again. Uh, 10,000 is the limit before you have to start paying. And the other great thing about MailChimp is it gives you all the legal requirements that you have to have uh, within the body of the email. Uh, you put in it why they are getting this email. Uh, it requires you to put that in there before you can send it out. And it gives all of the legal statements in there that's required. And it also requires you to put who you are and why they are receiving the email. You can see that at the bottom of uh, Justin's thing there. This email was sent to Justin. How, why did I get this? So you click on the link to find out why you're included in that. It gives you the opportunity to unsubscribe, update your preferences, and the details of where it's coming from. And then MailChimp right underneath it. So it yeah. says it comes from MailChimp. Okay. So anybody that wants to hang around and uh, maybe set up a page or if you have any more questions, uh, we're going to go offline here right now or off the tape, but you're welcome to stay. So thank you very much for Mike uh, and Justin. Did an awesome job. Lots of good information. Thank, thank you, Wendy. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you guys for attending. Thank you all for being here. See you at, see you at the banquet.